This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for April 6, 2021. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find our podcast on the Voices of Wrestling feed or on our own dedicated Open the Voice Gate podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you would like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing page. And you click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one-time or reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears. Joined as always by my friend and co-host, Case Lowe. In case it is time, the buffet has been opened for service here. Are you ready to get into it and get all around? And I'm botching this right now, but I'm going with this, with the Dragon Gate Buffet. Or Dragon System Buffet. I named this thing. I should know what it's called. I, I like the the concept of we're getting all around this buffet, and that is the perfect verbiage to use. And, and the buffet, Mike Spears, is the perfect analogy to use, because over this past week since our last recording, both of us have gotten the first dose of our COVID-19 vaccine. We are Camp Moderna. I am choosing to name it a camp like an MMA fight uh, because it is a full body experience when you get the Moderna vaccine, and I highly recommend it. Can I ask up top, how did your vaccination process go? You know, it was pretty all right. So South Carolina opened it up to everyone about the age of 16 last Wednesday. Last Wednesday, and th- this is like the one time that I will actually say South Carolina government, you did a good thing. Woke up at 6 a.m. on Wednesday, had an appointment scheduled by 6.05 for Friday, went to a Baptist church because that's where everything happens in South Carolina. I vote in a church. I get my shots in a church. It's just what it is. And it was run by the Department of Health. Was in, was out, got my shot, no complications. And I'm already halfway to being able to go walk into a dive bar and lick the floor. Case, how was your, how was your experience up in Chicago? It's good. You know, Chicago, as I've, I think I've maybe even said it on the show, but it's a frequent discussion in the Voices of Wrestling Slack. It's like Chicago was caught off guard that there was going to be a vaccine. The first two and a half months of this rollout process, they were so ill-prepared. It was incredible. But uh, about three or four weeks ago, they finally hit their groove and so I was able to get one through the Walgreens app, but that's what I've been telling people here is to go through a pharmacy rather than going through the county because I, I live in you know the largest county in Chicago. Uh, so there's just a lot of traffic there. I went to a Walgreens. I was very stressed out because I'm not entirely sure as of the time we're recording this even who is eligible to get it and who isn't in terms of an age cutoff. Uh, with, sure. my, with my job... Uh, I, I'm a, a producer for a radio show, so I am lucky. I'm considered to be a broadcaster, so I was compiling, uh, like, uh, what the like, uh, pay stubs is the word I'm thinking of. I was compiling pay stubs and like proof of employment and all of this stuff just in case they saw a young lad walk up to the counter and go like, no, 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 not you yet. Uh, then the night before, I called my friend who had already had his COVID vaccine. He's like, dude, I'm unemployed, and I got mine. Like, you have nothing to worry about. So I went to the Walgreens. They were very nice. I filled out the form. Uh, while I was waiting, there was a girl who was my age who had just gotten hers, and she was in, like, the cool-down period to make sure she didn't pass out before she could go. And I was thinking in my mind, like, man, what a great meet-cute 
opportunity this would be like two people getting their COVID vaccine together and I overheard her saying it was her first so we'll see each other again in a few weeks probably like wouldn't this be uh, just the most romantic thing ever she did not look in my direction I think she felt that I was thinking that in like just dead stare ahead was not interested rightfully so shouldn't have been but it was something I was thinking and something she was desperately trying to prevent uh, I did get the vaccine it was painless it was easy I didn't feel any symptoms after the fact. Now, I think for people like us who haven't had COVID, the second one is the one that's going to be a little tougher for us. At least that's been uh, the general population's experience. So I will be fully vaccinated by the end of April. And then from there, you know, again, I'm looking floors like Mike Spears. I mean, you, you, you have it like set what, what you're going to be able to do, by the way, because you'll get the vaccine. You'll have your two week like period of where you're just everything you're just kind of like okay got to make sure everything kicks in but by the time that you have your virtual graduation you'll be able to do whatever you want at that point that's you know that's within the thing. reason my within my, two, reason. my two week period ends the day i graduate from college which is like a beautiful bit of poetry and at this point because i've got a group of like six or seven friends most of them will have been fully vaccinated and had their two week period completed by the time I get my second one. So really, by the end of April, I will be able to form a social bubble and see people in person again, which is tremendous. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Mike, I was not planning on bringing this up on the air. I do not mean to bum rush you with this topic, but I was thinking okay. about my meet cute opportunity. And, and this is not horny. This is, you know, obviously open the voice gate, not a horny show, but. We have been talking off the air a few times about how one of the many great things about your dog, Pudge, is that you have run into this woman who you refer to as your future ex-wife. Have you seen her lately? How is she doing? Do you have any updates? I do not have any updates. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know how much about Pudge I've really talked about on air. Uh, Pudge was a farm dog, and I'm, try I'm trying to see through the back of my eye if he woke up when I'm saying his name. He's pretty smart something but, about it, calling him a farm dog which is exactly what it is i was like damn that sounds mean like that sounds like an insult that like jay no. briscoe would use in a promo <laughs> no 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 he was he, he was born on a farm but because of that uh i'm of the belief that the water supply was contaminated and he came down with something called giardia which is basically intestinal parasites and he also has like a whole bunch of worms because they didn't take care of him as well as they should have so i was scrambling because they i uh, they did not do what is called a sanitary groom do you know what a sanitary groom is case uh it sounds awful but please describe it for me a sanitary groom is where you shave around a dog's uh butthole and whatever that they urinate from so they so, so that things stay clean he did not get one so all the while, before I knew he had these intestinal diseases and was having terrible poops, his poops, like, I'm not afraid of dog poop whatsoever anymore. I have seen some really just cosmic core shit, literally, literally. But because they didn't do this, uh, sometimes, like, like, he has what, what you would call, like, a wavy coat, you know? I mean, kind of not like a sheepdog, but not dissimilar, but... uh some of the poop got caught in it and within like the first two days of him coming home and I was freaking out and like I grew up around dogs and like all of this but like when you're a kid you don't think about stuff like oh is my puppy sanitary groomed and he wasn't so luckily no one else could take him and just to literally do a razor to take the clippers to the butthole and the uh and, and the wiener to, to be as i'm stammering here because i'm trying not to disobey these things so uh luckily PetSmart, there is a lovely person at PetSmart who took care of him and i promptly just because i was freaking out like to the extent of this and then i found out he had worms and i freaked out even more when he had these issues but uh there was a very nice uh groomer at PetSmart, who I quickly refer to as my future ex-wife because she saved my life that day. And let, let, let's be quite honest with me. I, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. The dedication to not being horny is incredible. I ask you about a woman uh, that seems lovely, and you did a three-minute monologue on your dog's butthole just to kill any possible mood that was there. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. I This is the Mike Spears experience. I'm a huge fan of it. I was thinking hey. today, I was like, man, I I hope 
AEW runs a show in Chicago that the fucking boys, meaning Aaron Bentley and Mike Spears, can can get up to. Because I I think I'm in need of a few short kings in my life this summer. It seems like a, a good thing for me to experience. I mean, All Out looks like it's still on the docket here. What to see if they actually, that might be their return to touring. I, that's I wouldn't that's my thought. That's what I'm hoping is that they yeah. they run dailies all throughout the summer and then come last week of August, we're packing the rafters of the Sears Center uh, and I, I am loving every second of it. So that's that's very nice, Mike Spears. I, I am sorry to bring that up on the air, but I was, oh, no, I, was gen- I was genuinely wondering. I hadn't talked to you uh, since last week about this situation, and that sounds terrific. I am of the belief that I will have a wife leave me one day. Uh, there's a lot of I don't know. Did you ever watch Ma- Mark Marin's TV show Marin on IFC? Marin? Yes, because of course uh, the true pod father Seth Romatelli had an appearance on there. <laughs> uh, there's two two things about Marin. One. The last episode of that show, I remember watching it because I had a whole thing. This is humiliating to say. This will uh, only a few people will get this, but I remember being in high school and on IFC, which is perhaps the least watched channel on cable, they had Portlandia, Comedy Bang Bang, and Marin kind of all in oh, the yeah. running order. And I remember thinking in high school, like, oh my god, my dream is to have a TV show on IFC, which you know how absurd that is, but that's what, like, 16-year-old me was like, I just want a TV show on that network. The final episode of Marin made me cry. I think it is beautiful television. It That last season is so well done, because the first season is really, like, Louis light. It's the same thing yeah. Louis was doing, but just kind of a West Coast version of it. And then the show really evolved, and, and he found this character. But there was just a lot of depressed Mark Marin moments of women leaving him. And I'm like, man, I just have a cosmic energy sense about this. Like, I, I feel this a little too much, uh, which is not a good thing. But if it makes for good TV, it makes for good TV. IFC, back, I don't think they have any actual productions they do anymore since Brockmire ended. But, like, they had a Kids to the Hall uh, reunion. Uh, the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret, which I enjoyed a whole lot. It had, uh, I'm blanking on his name, but I also had Sharon Horgan in it. And then also, right now, because they are currently doing co-productions, they have this show. I, I, I don't know if we talked about this case, but I've become a really big Matt Berry fan. Matt Berry of... Uh, he is a British comedian. He's probably best known for Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, What We Do in the Shadows, and my personal favorite show of his, Toast of London. But he's doing like this period cop drama that is also on IFC, and he has he has a voice uh, he has a voice case that if you hear his voice, you'll know immediately who I'm talking about. That name sounds familiar, so I would imagine I know who he is. He's also appeared on the Mighty Boosh, the IT crowd, like he, the, the, like all those British comedians end up in the same shows. You know, what I mean, like there's like a certain like generation that like with like N- Noel Fielding and Richard Ayoade, they just appear everywhere together eventually, and and that's part of what I was watching during lockdown. What I like about this show, we not only talk about obscure wrestling, we also talk about obscure comedy that no one has ever seen before, and that is the Open the Voice Gateway. Hey, it uh, Toast of London is on Netflix, at least for our United States uh, listeners. If you like very kind of absurdist comedy, it's worth going out there and checking it out. With that in mind, let us dig into the buffet, Mike. What is on tap for us today? Well, we have a lot that we're going to be talking about. It's going to be a true smorgasbord here on Open the Voice Gate at the Dragon System Buffet. But as soon as like this got reannounced, we knew that this would be the lead topic because Case... We now have an official press statement. We have a video. Dragon Gate and MLW are back on, and they are now re- they have reiterated their strategic alliance. I think that's the words that MLW used for it. <laughs> but they had a video on their Never Say Never episode of Fusion this uh, last week that was I think it was the exact same video that they aired before. But Dragon Gate and MLW are now back together, and it's pretty exciting stuff, if you ask me. I'm pumped about it. I I don't think I had seen that video before, so if they re-aired it, it was still new to me. So I would imagine it it was new to most of our listeners. It's 
a really well put together package. They don't really highlight anyone in particular with the exception of, of maybe Yamato who gets a lot of coverage in it, but it shows the roster. It shows what Dragon Gate does. It's very well put together and not to continue to pour dirt on the grave of Dragon Gate USA, but it's, I, you know, I don't think Dragon Gate USA ever had a video that looked as good as that. So uh, we are off to a good start here. And I have a list of names. I, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, who could be coming over. I know we were given some names last year. I have some names confirmed for who MLW, I will phrase it as, would like to bring over. I, I think that's a fair way to say it. Mike, would you like to hear these names? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued to see the, or hear this list of names. I have a feeling. Uh, can I guess some names and we can see how close I am to it? Please. All right, well, Yamato, that's number one. Yes, and, and like, Yamato has publicly tweeted about it. He said he was excited, which I was thinking today, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been nine years since Yamato has wrestled in America, so that is, that is hard to believe. So, it's Yamato, I'm guessing Ata. Ada was, was Ada? The, Ada was the name that I couldn't think of today. I believe he is penciled in. Yeah, uh, I'd be stunned if Ben K is not mentioned. And given for when they were wanting to start this relationship, it would have been Shun Skywalker and Yuki Yoshioka, maybe Big R Shimizu as well, and Dragon Kid. So what I was told from a source on February 12th of last year, this is 2020, uh, February 12th, my birthday also, I was told that Ben K, Big R, Shun Skywalker, and Yamato are confirmed. Uh, that I, I, we've probably said that on the show. I think Ata was also on that list that was added later. Uh, so I, that list is interesting because you have Big R Shimizu in there. Obviously, if I was, you know, sending Dragon Gate talents to the States, Ben K, Shun, Yamato, Ata, boom, those guys are in. In February of last year, Big R Shimizu was just at such a drastically different spot in his career that. I would have to wonder if he would also be on that list now. Is that a fair uh, concern to have? Yeah, but I think we're now at a point that with what's going to be happening this weekend, that I think that's fair to say that he could be re-entering a level of that, or rather he might be under a new character that might be reverting to seriousness. There's a possibility there, at least. Yes, so that that is fair. So in terms of deep Twitter investigating which I did, and I looked at Court Bauer's Twitter. Court Bauer runs MLW. He follows from the Drangate roster Yamato, who we know is in. He also follows Kai and Kazuma Sakamoto. Now, those yes. are two guys that obviously have experience outside of Drangate. I, I, has Court Bauer, did he work with the WWE? I feel like he's been everywhere and nowhere at the same yes. time. I don't really know his career. He, uh, Court Bauer, is a former writer for WWE. He worked there in 1999 through, I think, 2002. So, I mean, that, he that was there during That would make sense with peak. the start date of the, the original MLW. With, with the original MLW, and then he's been doing stuff there. He might have worked back with WWE since then, but I'm certain he was there during the Attitude Era. I'm fairly certain about that. But very interestingly enough, Court Bauer is someone who's had his... Uh, fingers in the buffet for a long time case yeah i wrote about that on voiceswrestling.com this past week uh on my blood generation versus do fixer article that is up now celebrating wrestlemania weekend with the match that made wrestlemania weekend a thing but in that article it details just how many times court bauer tried to get Torimon into mlw a repeated agonizing process over 2002 and 2003 and into early 2004. This is something Corp Bauer's been trying to do for almost 20 years now, and it just so happened that last year when he finally was able to work out a deal, we had a pandemic that took it away from him. But but he wanted, I think that the list was like, uh, he wanted Dragon Kid and Shuji Kondo and Suwa and Shima and Magnum Tokyo and all of these guys over there. Bauer was going to bring the six-sided ring to MLW. He had two different shows scheduled with a six-sided ring. Both of those shows ended up being canceled, so he was never given the opportunity to do it. And then I also have in the article some notes that I did not know until very, very recently that in the NWA TNA days of that promotion, they also tried to bring in Toribon guys, and they were unsuccessful in doing so. 
boy, that's something that you know that there's probably other than like the the like the famous like ECW trying to bring in all Japan guys, more independent promotions have tried to bring in the Dragon System. But like you don't hear this about like oh we're gonna try to bring in Big Japan anymore. You don't really hear that as much. But you you constantly discover that and. It's something that I think it's pretty interesting, and I think that's a positive relationship. Of course, MLW is basically available everywhere. I think like their YouTube. It, I used to be a lot more on MLW, and then especially when the whole Dragon System got involved, that is something. <laughs> it, the, the, the original announcement. I'll just say this here: the original announcement happened right after, like the segment after a Philly taping. Where Jacob Fatu, who I still believe is the MLW World Heavyweight Champion, but yes. he was he was at the time had a match against Shima of Strong Hearts fame, of which they took Shima out in a body bag. The irony of that was not lost with people I've talked to within Dragon Gate. So yes, yeah, so there's there's more to that in just a second. So like I mentioned, Corp Bauer follows Yamato Kai and Kazuma Sakamoto. With Kai and Sakamoto, it's weird. I could see. It. Bauer following them to get them to MLW. I can also just see Corp Bauer following them because one of them's a Mudo student and one of them used to be in the WWE. If it were any other right. two guys on the roster, I'd be like, oh, they're coming over. But those two specifically, it raised my interest, but I don't have any info there. I should also note that the MLW Twitter account follows not only Shun Skywalker, but follows KZ. So we're looking at really a core group of Ben K, Shun Skywalker, Yamato, KZ, and we'll say Eita, and then some combination of Kai, Cosmo Sakamoto, and Big R Shimizu, because, you know, Shimizu was a heel the last, or in at, at this time last year. Maybe Kai and Cosmo are his heel replacements. I don't know. That's pure speculation. It's something that it's really interesting, like this group, because with the exception of Yamato and Eita, you, you know, most of these people would have have started like since uh, like Shimizu had his first few years in the dying days of USA, but most of these people did not have the opportunity to KZ was spent excursion in Mexico, training with Skyda and appearing like four times in Mexico never appeared in Dragon Gate USA. And it's interesting that they're going in that lane versus the tried and true of, you know, Naruki Toy, uh, Masato Yoshino, you probably just write that off, but a lot of, of like the classic names, he's going with the generation that's going to be around in the future, and I think that's very interesting. And in case I don't know if you saw this, but I, I remember like seeing this in the Observer, like when this the deal first got announced, and it was looking like it was going to be a sure thing, and of course COVID happened, the world changed. But Jacob Fatu was looking to be someone that was going to be brought over to Dragon Gate as a member of Red. Mike, this is why I love you. This is what I was going to next. First of all, in terms of what you said about the generations being brought over, MLW has nailed this from my perspective so far. We'll see how they're presented when they eventually come over to the States, but everything I know about the situation right now, I am a fan of. I love that they're using the new guys and that for as much as I like them, it's not Doi and Dragon Kid and whoever else. It's the guys that should be brought over. And I, I almost wish they would skew younger a little bit, but... We'll see as time goes on whether or not that happens. As for Jacob Fontu, there is a note in the February 10th, 2020 Wrestling Observer Newsletter in the MLW section, which talks about what you just talked about in terms of the Fatu versus Shima match, how all of these Strong Hearts guys were written off, uh, So one, so they could go to AEW full-time, and then two, so that the Drangate uh, relationship could begin. And at the end mm -hmm. of that paragraph, Dave says... Uh, the side started talking in the fall of 2019. Jacob Vontu was also expected to go uh, to Dragon Gate for some matches this year. I'm sure we mentioned that on the show at some point in this past year, but I had zero memory of that being a thing. I reached out to someone today who would know, and their response was, oh yeah, no, he was booked. Like, he was he was going to come over, and then it, COVID happened, so we obviously couldn't. So... I would like to think at some point in 2021, we'd get Jacob Fatu in Dragon Gate because he is a guy who I really like as he is, but I do think he's a guy who needs to work with opponents better than him. And if he spent even a, a month in Dragon Gate, I think he would come out an entirely new man. Yeah, and as we've seen in Dragon Gate's history, they know how to book Gaijin to their strengths. Like, 
that there's no company I'd feel more confident in saying, okay, here's Jacob Fatu. And then they would be like, all right, this is what we're going to have for you. And, you know, he's someone with enough cachet. And I mean, they were building up Brody Lee for this. He could end up being someone who does like a tour and like he starts the tour by attacking whoever's the Dreamgate champion, if it be Yamato or Shin Skywalker. And at the end of the tour, have a Dreamgate shot. Like I could see that happening and, and they book that accordingly. That was going to be my comparison as well. Is this is someone that could, I think, very easily fill the role that Brody Lee had in Drangate when he did two tours in 2011. He worked great against the Strong Hearts guys. I think he works really well against smaller wrestlers in general. Assuming he gets over there, I think that is going to be a huge win for both sides in terms of both Fatu and for Dragon Gate. The rest of the MLW roster, it's just uh, it's such a bizarre collection of talent. I mean, you know, Leo Rush is their middleweight champion. I don't know if he's a guy that would go to Japan, but he's a guy that I would certainly like to see wrestle Dragon Gate guys in America. Yeah, I would love to see him wrestle it. He is someone who does New Japan. Oh so. my god, that's right. You're right. So that's that's interesting. I wonder if he's just completely written off. Leo Rush, by the way, uh, and this is this will sound like a call out. It was actually a compliment to Leo Rush. I don't know if he still does it because it's been a minute since I've seen him wrestle, but I know when he was working in Ring of Honor before he got signed, he used to steal a spot straight out of Shima's playbook where he would do a frog, spla- frog splash into a suicide dive kind of in the corner of the ring. It always looked awesome when he did it. I was a big fan of that spot. Other guys on the roster, you know, ACH, who again is New Japan affiliated, Calvin Tankman, who I think is is very talented, Septimo Dragon, who I really like and who is tight with uh, some of the luchadors that Drangate has brought in in the past, your Flamita uh, types of wrestlers. I know Septimo Dragon has a relationship with them. Also, just funny considering Drangate USA, TJP is on the roster. Obviously, New Japan guy, but the friction between Gabe Sapolsky and TJP in 2010, which is why TJP left the promotion, was Gabe said that TJP wasn't good enough to work Japan. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like one of those insane things. Uh, and, th- and then when, like, you, as you, like, look down the roster there of people that could do well, like, they're, they're not necessarily people that I think incredibly highly of, but I know others do. I mean, injustice of Myron Reed and Jordan Oliver people, I mean, you you look at, like, younger people on the roster. There, there's no one on this roster that would not benefit from some time in Kobe, but, like, those two guys, like, stick out to me as guys that could really, like, go take a longer excursion and then come back, like, completely different wrestlers. I've seen Myron Reed wrestle what feels like a thousand matches because he's an AAW regular. He's on pretty much all of their shows. He is super talented but yeah, he. I mean, oh my God! If Dragon Gate could get their hands on him, it would immediately take him to the next level. And that's the kind of guy that that Dragon Gate, I think, thrives in terms of molding and crafting into being a better wrestler. Myron Reed is a perfect candidate for someone that I would want to go to Japan. Jordan Oliver is interesting because I think I have a, a really different perspective on him than most people because I I'm not super familiar with his MLW work. I don't watch him in Game Changer. But I watch him in AAW, which is a much more hands-on independent promotion where they, uh, you know, give their wrestlers a lot of notes and things to work to. And there's an element of long-term booking there. And Oliver was a guy that came in right before COVID. And I remember him debuting in AAW and going like, yo, that is a guy who's not there yet, a long ways off, but that is a guy that has something. And every time I see him work in AAW, I get really excited about how he works, but the vibe I get from people talking about how he works in Game Changer and how he works in MLW is that AAW has him restrictive isn't the right word, but there's a little more thought and care put into his in-ring performances there. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a fair bit of him outside of AAW. I've actually seen him on Game Changer, and that is what I would say is a very fair assessment there. But I think that that's someone to do with this. Zenshi is someone also that I could see going over for a longer tour. Kevin Koo would be interesting. Like, Violence is Forever would be very interesting, but I don't think that act would get over at all in Japan. But I think that you can get some real interesting matchups for nerds like me out of those two. Like, if it, Violence is Forever versus Mochi Fuji is a tag match that I'd be very into. I was I, I was just looking at the roster thinking, how can I get King Mo into Dragon Gate? Like, what do I have to do? <laughs> Who do I have to pay? Do I have to call Genki Horiguchi and be like, hey, 
look, I said some nice things about you on a pro wrestling torch show a few months ago. If you could do me this favor and fly King Mo over to Japan, you're not familiar with King Mo, the former Bellator fighter. Uh, that would that'd be a solid. If you could do that, I would just like to see him in that environment. King Mo versus Konamaui Chikawa. Book it. Oh my god, it'd be tremendous. It would be tremendous, but it's interesting. And it's something that I know that before this was announced, they were looking into trying to do a show in Hawaii, which would be a lot easier to get people over for. And I can see that happening. Dragon Gate has run shows i think it was with azw action zone wrestling in yes. hawaii before so i could see that happening like that's not just a court power saying stuff to say stuff to get attention that is something that i would put at a better than 25 percent possibility mlw if you're listening let me make a suggestion chicago is the place to be you run here already i can get to your venue by public transportation by all means, feel free to bring in Drangate guys to Chicago. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if they would ever look into running the upstate South Carolina, but hey, Charlotte <laughs> or Atlanta, those aren't the, 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 those are cities that people have heard of, not Spartanburg. But it's going to be interesting, and it's something that, uh, of course, we'll keep tags on tabs on as the situation develops. But that was not the only kind of news within Dragon Gate worth talking this week, as there was a kind of mysterious uh, press release that was put out last weekend on the 4th talking about a COVID outbreak. And it's something that is – Dragon Gate's been very lucky. They've had temperature. They, they, they've mainly taken – when people got gotten taken off the shows beforehand, it was all temperature-based and everyone tested negative. It was a trainee in the dojo that tested positive and they pulled people from the shows that weekend because of – covid and contract tracing and so it was announced on the second they were pulled on shows on the third and the fourth i do not think that they've run a show since the fourth but with corkin this week it's a very kind of interesting situation i i say interesting not like oh this is interesting but this is one of those things that kind of take you aback for a second and dragon gate is a very unique company in that the contract tracing is very important case for this and it's notable who have been pulled from shows so far yeah an entire unit bit the dust over this past week on the house shows now i, I will say before mike continues we kind of learn we record tuesday nights typically drangate likes to release their cards on wednesday mornings this is the best night that works for us it's super inconvenient i apologize this whole thing could be rendered useless by the time the corkin card comes out but on the house shows, an entire unit was wiped out, and that could, with the information we have now at press time, it could affect the Cork and Hall show. Yeah, so looking at the shows that they've changed it, the, the big one that was like the major tell was there was a show in Gifu, Japan. It was Shun Skywalker and Problem Dragon's Homecoming. And Shun Skywalker and the rest of Masquerade were pulled from the show. I or were not listed on it, and there was a tweet from Shun Skywalker, very sad about missing his first homecoming as champion and homecoming since his excursion. And you look at the shows, those are the very obvious people who were left off, and it, you would think, oh, okay, that must mean that something was up there. Looking at the rest of the people that I'm assuming have been pulled, UT is notable that he was not listed on these shows. And I'm trying to see, I have not seen Susumu uh, Yokosuka on these shows as well but susumu is not based in is not based in kobe if i'm right susumu so was on those shows he teamed with kz on the first night and ultimo on the second there's the kz match on okay i see it now i apologize you so, so he was not pulled from it but ut if he was on i've not seen what the cards were beforehand i might look this up in a second but ut looks like he was pulled from those shows yeah, hold on. I was actually, I was looking at the, the, the Drangate website is way too confusing. Uh, Susumu was not on, this is, this is thrilling radio right here as I dig through the <laughs> Gifu card. As we, tr as we try to pull this up here. All right. Susumu I think was I have... not on those shows that I can see. You are correct. I was looking at the end of March results, not the beginning of April. So, but with Susumu, as I said, he's someone that sometimes, be, well, I think it's worth stating here and the kind of way to explain why we go to Susumu and I've been thing. So Dragon Gate, unlike a lot of other promotions, to my knowledge, is very based around Kobe. 
a lot of people, a lot of wrestlers stay living in, within the dojo deep into their career to the extent that uh, Ben K was considered the dojo manager slash dad last year after he was Dreamgate champion. So you have this dojo, and then usually what would happen is that there is a lot of dormitories there. So the veterans who do not live natively in Kobe, they have their own hometowns that they live in while they're based in Tokyo. They would come into Kobe before the tour starts and the tour will start there. So if you ever notice on social media, whenever you would like see a photo of people in bunk beds at, and what it looks like, like a dormitory, especially like Suji Kondo was like the very noticeable one in Susumu, but that's because they would come into Kobe and they would be based around there that they would do some training they would do whatever and then they would leave from there so that's why it's a very particularly kind of uh fluid situation and until we get that corking card we probably won't be able to determine like that what has happened apparently the trainee te- uh, the trainee was systematic and uh, they have not announced as of time of recording of course this was three days ago so it's a very fluid situation of other positives within dragon gate yeah, so that that is that is the lowdown there. Very unfortunate situation. I, uh, Susumu not being on those shows is something I hadn't realized until you brought it up. But we see on his Twitter all the time, he's hanging out with Takedo Kame at the dojo. So he is very, I, I would say it's very easy for him or a realistic possibility for him to be in that contact tracing pool. Something to think about. At least you're updated as to what was going on this prior week. And we will see when the Corkin card comes out, whether or not they open the Dreamgate champions on the show. Yeah, so what all we know for Corkin already, I'm just I think this is just natural time to talk about it, case. Please. We have the Naruki Doi returning match as he came to save Masato Yoshina from a beatdown. Naruki Doi and and Hip Hop Kakuda join the four men who will be in the cage at Dead or Alive on May fifth. It is Naruki Doi, Yamato, and Dragon Kid versus Kai, SB Kento, and Hip Hop Kakuda. That over the last week case, or really since Memorial Gate that match has become more and more important as we've gone along there. And notably, Naruki Doi quit Team Boku over Twitter before this. And of course, the Mascara Contra Mascara, Boku Domo Dragon versus Diamante will be happening on the 9th as well. So that's Friday morning on in North America. That is Friday evening in Japan. I think that's will be Friday afternoon in Europe. I have no feel for the mask versus mask match. We talked about it last week at the Memorial Gate review. I just, I don't know what tone it's going to take. I don't know what the match is going to look like. I have no feel there. I do know I am really, really excited for the main event. I think Doi is going to come out bringing it. I think SBK or Kakuta for that. I, I, I think, I think Kakuta's pinning Naruki Doi in his return match. I think it's going to be awesome. And I really hope after a, a string of shows that were just odd in Cork and Hall because of the the COVID restrictions that were in place with the the curfew in February and March where those shows were were good but I didn't really get a great match and and every drink at Cork and you know selfishly I would like to have at least one four star match or higher to you know fully give it the thumbs up to get some uh, fans hover hovering around the perimeter of Drangate to say no you need to go watch this show I think that main event's going to be great. I'm really, really excited for it because the the first quarter of this year, no Dragon Daya, no Takedo Kame, no Masato Yoshino, no Naruki Doi. We're going to back into the flow of things, and I think Doi's going to bring it, and I think that match is going to be great. And it's going to be interesting just to see how the whole unit landscape is not solidified yet, especially with the fact that Bokudomo Dragon's in a Puestas that I think I would put money on. I would put money on Diamante winning that match. So it looks like that I think we're probably going to have at least another new unit before. Uh, I don't know if it's by King Gate, but I, th- I would say by the end of the summer, we'll at least have some new units there. So it's going to be interesting to see because if Naruki Doi takes the fall there, then you have like a big giant question mark because he's not going to go to Masquerade. He's not, he was, he's not going to go into natural vibes at that point. You would have to think that there would be another unit coming out of this. Yeah, you would think, and, and I think it would be interesting to throw Doi into that Mochizuki, Yoshida, Fuji mix, just because those are guys that we've never either seen together before, or in the case of Doi and Mochizuki, it's been 15 years, maybe, since they've been in the same unit. And- later. Later. I mean, Final MTK finished up before, or was finishing up before he joined Blood Generation. 
Yeah, you're looking at 2003, 2004, the last time those guys were really aligned. We've obviously seen a lot of Doi and Yoshida, but we've seen them as heels and Berserk and, and uh, wherever, Matt Blanky and Blood Warriors. Quite an illustrious run there. So even just that, you know, those guys we've seen together, but not in this role. I wouldn't hate seeing those guys join forces. I don't see Doi joining high end just because no. some, somebody has to take a fall there. I mean, that unit without Doi is absurdly loaded. If Doi gets into that unit, uh, my God, I mean, the t-shirts they would sell, but <laughs> I, I don't see that happening. So yeah, there, there's definitely room on the roster for one, if not two more units, and, and we'll kind of see the fallout on Friday. And then, you know, by that point, it's dead or alive season. There's not a ton of televised shows in April. I think there's four or five on the Dragon Gate Network, so we're already gearing up. I think a lot is going to happen on these shows because they don't have, you know, Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto, Fukuoka, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. It's a pretty sparse schedule this month, so I think you're going to see a lot of things happen on these shows. Yeah, so the schedule for April is uh, Fukuoka next weekend, April 19th, throw their traditional double shot there. And then later that week, that Thursday on the 22nd, Kobe Sambo Hall. And then the 24th is the Speed Star Final Countdown in Higashi Osaka, which, you know, it's something where we're probably seeing how they've kept him out. He's been doing treatment. We're probably going to only have a handful of Masato Yoshino matches, but that's all we really have for April. We've talked before about how if the first week of May does not kill us, then the by the end of week, we will be dead, basically, because of all these shows. I would not be surprised if that Yoshino homecoming show, assuming he can wrestle, is Doi, Yamato, Dragon Kid, and Yoshino versus Kai, SB Kento, Kakuta, and Eita. I'd not be surprised yeah. if that happened. But we, we don't know if Yoshino is wrestling on his final homecoming show or not. Who knows? Yeah, we still do not know that yet. But... Before we move on, support for Open the Voice Gate is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. Manscaped's trust by over 2 million men worldwide. We have exclusive offer for our listeners, 20% off plus free shipping with the promo code OTVG. That's right, Open the Voice Gate's initials at manscaped.com. In case... It's always something that's very tricky when, like, you, l- l- we've talked a little bit about fleeting love list, uh, love interests earlier, but, you know, it, it's something where, like, you, with the products, most products out there, like, you get in some dangerous territory, and it's not just for people who have a penis, but just in general, like, you, you, you're dealing with, with some very fragile goods down there, Case. Mike, it's not that hygiene is a weakness of mine, but... It's not my biggest strength either. And for a lot of my life, I was using the terminology that I would bick my boys. uh, That down there, I would go in with a normal razor and I would essentially uh, uh, whack the weeds quite, quite literally. And it was a a stressful uh, process. I would have to be very fine with my movements, be very careful with what I did. But Manscaped makes all of that easier. They help me feel clean. They help me feel nice. I once had a girlfriend tell me that my hands smelled really bad consistently. And that is one of the meanest things that has ever been said to me. Because I don't know what that means. But I do know that when I'm using my Manscaped products, I feel very clean. My whole body smells good. Down there, up there, my hands, it doesn't matter. I get a 10 out of 10 all the time. I love my Manscaped lawnmower, and I hope you do too. That's right. The lawnmower 3.0 comes inside their brand new Perfect Patch 3.0, which includes everything you need to keep trimmed, cut free, and spilling nice down there. You have the lawnmower 3.0 with their advanced skin safe technology and LED light, so it's waterproof. So you're able to take care of it when you take care of everything else in the shower, but also in the Perfect Package 3.0. They have a crop reviver and the crop preserver to make sure that you, everything down there is not sweating, smelling, or sticking. And you could get all of this with promo code OTVG. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Again, get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code OTVG at manscaped.com. That's 20% off of free shipping at manscaped.com and use promo code OTVG. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. 
80 degrees in Chicago today. Glad I had my crop preserver with me. Buddy, we had like this crazy storm that came through last week that knocked everything down into like we were getting hard freeze warnings, which is an issue because South Carolina, people don't really know this. The majority of the peaches, the number one peach producing state in the United States is not Georgia. They're lying to you. It's South Carolina, but they had to put a warning out there to cover your crops. And then today it was 82. So five days difference. We had hard freeze. And now we have, well, this is one more temperate days on record. It snowed here last week, and then today I uh, had to go to Target to get a tape measure, Tums, and I ended up with a Gatorade there, too. Because I, when I go to Target, I don't go there often. I do like just, I like grabbing the most random items together possible. So today was a tape measure, Tums, and a Gatorade. And by the end of it, I was, I was kind of sweating when I got back to my apartment. It was the first 80-degree day of the year, and it felt every bit of that temperature. Oh, God. And I can only imagine that, like, Chicago, like, you do get a level of humidity there. And then with all the buildings, like, that, it, it's in for a gross summer, I had to say. I, I have never experienced a Chicago summer, as wild as that is. I've lived here four years now, senior in college, first two years, had a girlfriend in Indiana. I would go back there during the summer. Last year, don't know if you follow uh, worldly events or not, there was a pandemic, so I did go back to Indiana to live with my parents as well. I'm looking forward to it, Mike. I'm going to be licking dive bar floors, and I'm going to have myself a Chicago summer. Cases, summer, Chicago. Uh, cases, summer in Chicago, 2021. I can't say that five times fast, but we should get merchandise out with that. <laughs> but we talked about the big topics, but we talked about this last week, Case. We, when we dip into the buffet, we like to kind of cover what all kind of permeates and what came together to create the style of wrestling, Lucha Rest, the house style of dragon gate and toriumon but there were promotions before it the the predecessor and the and the root to the lucha rest tree starts with grand hamada and starts with universal Ucha libre or also referred to as hamada's uwf in case you brought this match to my attention that we're going to talk about so why don't you intro it yeah so i have to thank uh bose johnny on twitter at bose johnny b-o-h-s johnny for Tipping me off to the the fact that archive.org has a tremendous library of wrestling, and I have to thank Bose Johnny here because I know he's not listening to this show. He is not sitting down and listening to a Dragon Gate podcast. Uh, but he let me know that there's, uh, let his Twitter followers know there's a bunch of wrestling on archive.org, and what they have is a tremendous archive of Hamada's Universal stuff. They have the pro shot footage the commercial tapes, and a bunch of handhelds that I have not seen anywhere else on the internet but there. So if you go to archive.org and you just type in Grand Hamada, you'll be able to find this stuff very, very quickly. And I've been going through this footage uh, mostly for the Greatest Wrestler Ever project that we've talked about on this show that Alan Forrell is hosting over at Pro Wrestling Torch. Hamada has been my biggest discovery of this entire project. I mean, I've watched a lot of Joshi. I've watched a lot of Rick Martel among others, no one has made the impression on me that Grand Hamada has. I always knew he was a very influential wrestler, a very important wrestler, especially as it pertains to the style of wrestling that I like. I am blown away at just how talented this man was, though. And I was going through footage, and this particular match jumped out at me. It was a trios match with Dr. Wagner Jr., El Texano, and Silver King against Grand Hamada and the men that would later be known as Super Delphin and Great Sasuke. Here they are under the names Masa Michinoku, which is the Great Sasuke, and Monkey Magic Wakita, which is the future Super Delphin. This is a two out of three falls match. You don't even have to go to archive.org for this match. I took the liberties of uploading this to my YouTube channel. I will make sure the link is in the description. And the reason that I think this match is so important is I think it is the first great Lucha Resu Trios match, a style that would become prevalent in Michinoku Pro, and then Toriyaman, and then Dragon Gate, and then the rest of the wrestling universe. Yeah, so the interesting thing about this match, it's from November 14th, 1991. This is from the, at least the last UWF Lucha Libre show that uh, Hamada was on. I believe they had a couple more years worth of the promotion, and they would come back and, and leave, and they would have a lot of different stuff there, but... It's just very remarkable to me that, like, this is what, one of the things they did. Like, I'm, like, looking at, like, these cards that they would have, and 
No, there there would be more of that. I was just looking at the wrong thing. I I I apologize. Yeah, Ham- but... Hamada's Hamada's there I, consistently through the end of the promotion, which would would make 93. sense. Yeah, it, it is his promotion. They they run consistently through ninety three, and then even they they go through a rebranding for a few shows in ninety four. And I just ran across. I think it was a handheld. I haven't seen it yet, but I know there's at least footage of one of those 1994 shows out there. As for the uh, revival tour they had in 1998, I haven't seen any of that. I don't know if that footage exists. But yeah, Hamada's working from the start of the promotion in March of 1990 through the end in December of 1993. Yeah, I'm looking at the actual last uh, uh, show for uh, ULL, and it's a best two out of three falls, six man tag team match. Dos Caras Jr. Giant Dos Caras and Cicadelco Jr. Uh, versus Necro Casas, Paroth Jr. and Viano Three, and then there is a, then there is another match. Uh, Paroth Jr. and Viano Three defeat Giant Dos Caras and ha- and Hisashi Shinmian or Shinma Hisashi Shinma. I'm just getting all kinds of things, Miss Brown's right now. It's kind of who, the uh, the Chikara effect. I cannot say any name in the Mike Quackenbush Quackenbush universe. I can't even say Mike Quackenbush, and you are. Uh, you're going to make it through these universal names, I promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Shinma, who is the former, one of the former heads of New Japan and was the technical money behind the UWF promotions, at least through 98. You know, that was the last match in ULL. I love that Super Crazy is on the show and he's defending. This is the final, this is the 1998, the final universal show from the, the Revival Tour. Super Crazy is on the show defending the UWA World Welterweight title which would later be defended in Toriumon X. So we are really seeing uh, the stretch of Dragon System influence throughout, at this point, multiple decades, which which you just love to see. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you have Manami Tenoda and Momoe uh, Nakanishi in a 12-minute match match two. What a great promotion of stuff. And, and then Mazada is opening the show because, of course, he is. <laughs> because, of course, he is. Because we can't escape that man. But that was 1998. This is 1991. It's November of 1991, November 14th of that year. And like I said, the match is a best two out of three falls six man. It's El Texano, Silver King, and Dr. Wagner Jr. against Hamada, Masa Michinoku, who is the future Great Sasuke, and Monkey Magic Wakita, who is the future Super Delphin. I watched this match. It blew me away. I watched it again today. I've seen it twice now. Mike, you watched it for the first time this week. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, like, you mentioned how Hamada has been the big discovery of the GWE pro- uh, program with you. For me, it, he's someone that I always kind of held in high regard, but being able to, like, put him under a, a more uh, deeper microscope, I guess, a more powerful microscope. And we're talking about a guy who is just, like, the, the crowd lives and dies by him. And it's something that, like, even at this match, he's already, like already like nearly 50 at this point and it's just like the command he had and to be quite honest uh sasuke and delphin like they played their roles excellently too uh delphin came in looking yoked in this match and then really the 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 thing that got me about this match was just like how well defined they have the technico side which are the which are the ul natives and then the uh, the the mexican luchadors are playing rudo there and it's just a very well constructed, incredible heel versus face dynamic where you don't, Los Cowboys and Dr. Wagner Jr. don't really cheat. They just brawl and bruise against all like the young upstarts and their trainer. And it's just like a fantastic formula for a 20 minute match here. And then just they, they hit every beat there. And you had like the big moments for both Michinoku and Wakita. And it's just fantastic stuff. What I like about this and why I think it is the first great Lucha Resu trios match. First of all, there's, I mean, UWF in 1990 is an incredible year for the promotion because you have Negro Casas versus uh, Yoshinara Asai, who had become Ultimo Dragon. All of that stuff is awesome. I highly recommend seeking that out. You have Hamada versus Pero Aguayo, and you have Hamada versus Blue Panther feuds that year. And you have, really, it's a promotion that isn't doing a lot of trios matches, but they're doing a lot of straight tag matches. And all of that stuff is very good. But it's not really until the end of 91 and then into 92 where you see this six-man really start to mold this promotion. There's a bunch of fun six-mans in 1992, but this is the first match that I can see 
the earliest match where they're doing something that is clearly inspired by Lucha Libre, but it has its own feel. And I like that this is two out of three falls because it really helps almost break down this formula that, again, we've now seen for, for 30 years where uh, early babyface fire, heels get the heat, heels get the first fall. Grand Hamada's comeback in the second fall of this match. Tremendous. There, and look, I am obviously critical of the current independent wrestling scene, although AEW just returned, and I, I do think they do a tremendous job. This is not even a dig at the wrestlers on this WrestleMania weekend, but take your best guy, take the best independent wrestler in the scene right now. They could not pull off a babyface comeback the way Grant Hamada did here. And the thing is, they could copy Hamada's comeback move for move, and people would lose their minds in 2021, 30 years before this, Hamada was blowing people's minds with, again, stuff that would hold up today. So you see the babyface come back. You see them get the second fall, which is all about making sure uh, Masa Michinoku gets the pin. It's a really nice moment when he gets that pin with the assist of, his, uh, with the assist of Hamada. And then you go on to the third fall, and you start to see things really break down. You see the dive train where, in this match, I believe it's this one where Michinoku, uh, Sasuke, screws up a Sasuke special earlier on in the match, and then towards the finishing stretch, perfectly executes a Sasuke special, and the crowd goes insane. It is the loudest pop of the match, and you start to see this dive train, you see guys going all over the place, and then eventually... Just like you would see R.E.D. beat Masquerade now, the heels end up coming out on top. They get the win. All six guys are tremendous in this match. It's, it's for me, probably in the four and a quarter, four and a half star range. And to yeah. me, the first the first great Lucha Resu Trios match, to my knowledge, that has ever existed. If we have people that are a little bit more affluent in Lucha or have seen, you know, more or just different Hamada's Universal than I have that feel like there's one prior to November of 1991, a trios match that isn't specifically a Lucha style trios match, but rather this Lucha Resu style that we would see in Michinoku, Toriyaman, etc. Please let me know. But for now, my demarcation point is this match. I think you can trace what was done here. And especially with Sasuke and Delphin being in this match, you can trace what they did here in the Michinoku Pro, which flows directly into Toriumon, Dragon Gate, and then, like I said, the rest of the wrestling world. Yeah, and then you have, like, the branch with Delphin, Osaka, and then Okinawa, and then and then Seafood Pro and Riku Dragon. Like, this is a big match that, like, lays down the roots there, and it's just, like, a very impressive match because it is doing something different, but keeping, like, the touchstones of, like, a classic uh, two out of three falls match and lucha libre but adding to it like the certain the certain facets there and i think part of that and we've talked mostly about the technico ull i guess army side is the fact that tejano and silver king as los cowboys are excellent in this dr wagner is someone that charisma wise i think he's one of the most charismatic charismatic wrestlers of the last generation but in 1991 not there yet but they the, the, the trio comes together as like this really brawling Rudo thing where like Hamada gets like a hot tag in the final fall and it's like oh he's about to like shut all these guys up and get the wins for the home team but then they cut him off and the way they cut him off the crowd like shrieks and it's amazing stuff like it's just a fantastic performance by all six men in this match clearly I don't know a ton about Los Cowboys because I was saying El Texano not El Tejano but I'm glad you mentioned that because Silver King in particular is a guy that I keep on running across because he wrestled Hamada so many times. Silver King is awesome. And I don't know if he's a guy that I necessarily want to to dive into for Greatest Wrestler Ever stuff as we approach the end of April deadline for that project. But Silver King is a guy going forward that is now on my list of luchadors of if I'm going through old stuff and I see a match of his on YouTube... I would like to sit down and watch it. I, I have become a really big fan of what he brings to the table. Again, like you mentioned, this this really aggressive, hard-hitting Rudo style that I think worked really well in Japan, and it makes sense why he was a regular in Hamada's Universal up until the day that it folded. It's a shame he never worked Michinoku Pro. I would have liked to have seen him in that environment. But yeah, the, the Rudos are terrific here. Hamada, like I said when I when I tweeted out about this match, 
he look. I mean, the 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 second fall of this match, I just can't get over his comeback and how he looks like the best baby face I have ever seen. And again, there's a guy, you know, an independent wrestler could do that spot, spot for spot, WrestleMania weekend, and it would bring the crowd to their feet. And Hamada was doing this 30 years ago. It's it's incredible. It, it it's really remarkable. So the thing that gets me with Hamada is his fluidity. And I've talked about this with you and Alan, but like, just like round offs. And parts where it looks like he's going to be back body dropped and instead he catapults over. He vaults over as if he was doing gymnastic and laying straight on his feet and the crowd just is in awe of it. It is. You, you don't see anyone who's able to do that nowadays. Like, like, who is the best person that you could think of nowadays doing flips out back body drops? I don't think anybody does that spot, which blows my mind. I've watched so much Hamada recently. I think if you if you let me go to wrestling school for a month— and then you gave me a time machine, and, and we're going to use the one time machine we've had that scientists have created, not to make history better, but to let me go back to 1992 to wrestle Grand Hamada. I think I got called in the ring with him, because I just, like, his spots are just embedded in me now, because I've been watching so much of him recently, and every match, it's the fluidity that you talked about. I don't think anybody does that back, back, that back body uh, counter that he does, the back body drop counter that he does. I don't think anybody does her Karanas the way he does. I don't think anybody flows from move to move the way he does. I, he is so, so impressive. And someone that I'm really glad I have carved out time to watch, not only because it gives me a greater understanding of, of the dragon system and whatever the style is that is obviously my preferred style of wrestling, but it, it just blows my mind. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, well-respected wrestling historians that couldn't really tell you a lot about Grand Hamada. And I think he's one of the most important wrestlers we've seen of the modern era. Yeah, and it's something that when you like you look at this match and we look at people involved, like Tejano was part of Los Misioneros de Muerte with Signo and and Blake. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name here. I'm blanking on, God, who's the other member of this? Negro Navarro. Negro Navarro. So like you have that. Silver King, who is... Dr. Wagner Jr.'s brother, who's also passed away. But it's just, like, remarkable, like, seeing this kind of match being done in 1991. And these are the kind of matches that, like, it's not as bloody as what Tejano had at Missionaris del, del Morte, but it's very much, like, you could see, like, the energy, like, with him and, like, his younger partners. And, like, Kamada is just... It, 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 I think you could absolutely be the stiff in a match with Grand Hamada and be three and a half stars. Case. Oh, just tell him to flip off you. 1991, 1992, Hamada, I think, absolutely. Uh, also on the show, and I don't think this is on tape, It's at least it's not uh, what I saw from the archive archive.org file that was president. There is a four-minute Global Wrestling Federation light heavyweight title match between Lightning Kid and the future Dick Togo on the show. That match ends in a countout in 416, Mike. This is just like an insane card. Like Blue Demon Jr. is in the is in the second match. You have an you have El Hio del Santo coming over for that, and he's going up against the the wrestler who would later be known as Heavy Metal. Like this is an insane show. And then you have, and, and then like this wasn't even the main event. You had uh, actually, I think I don't remember which one crush Jado and Gato with uh, Kendo, who is a who who has been like different. He's been a lot different. Uh, uh, gimmicks over the time, but you have them in the main event there. Like this is remarkable stuff that was happening in Hamada's U U W F U slash U L L. Yeah. So if you don't necessarily care about Hamada, but are intrigued by what we're talking about, and maybe need more incentive to check out some of this footage, which there's, a, I mean, forget archive.org. There's a ton of it on YouTube because Roy Lucier is everywhere and is eternal, and he has a ton of this stuff uploaded onto his Japanese Classics YouTube channel. You're getting. Gato and Jado before they were Gato and Jado. You're getting Sasuke and Delphin before they were under those gimmicks, and then a little bit afterwards. There's there's a great Hamada versus Sasuke singles match. It's one of Sasuke's first matches with that gimmick, and it's it's either an early '92 or early '93 where Hamada just beats the hell out of him, and it is it is a terrific terrific match to watch. And then you get you know not only the the lucha legends like Blue Demon Jr. and Santo and Silver King. But you get a young Dick Togo in this in this promotion, as well as young Sean Waltman and young Jerry Lynn. It's an, it's, wild. it's an incredible roster. A real quick trivia question, Mike. The last man to hold the Global Light Heavyweight Championship 
a Japanese wrestler. Think okay. Think early two thousands New Japan. I think. I mean, that's not a hint, but that's that, that's the hint I'm going to give you. Any idea as to who the last global middleweight champion was? New Japan early two thousands would have to be a, someone who was a junior, not Koji Kanemoto. God, no, I wish. Uh, no, the last global light heavyweight champion, Osamu Nishimura. Yeah, you have to get there with the Muka. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. I am I am <laughs> one of the biggest Fujinami fans there is, and I remember in 2016 going through Greatest Wrestler Ever Viewing, and one of my big projects ended up being watching just about every Fujinami match I could find, and the rep on him was always like, ah, oh, you know, he's he's. I think Fujinami's the best wrestler of the 80s. That's a very controversial opinion, but it's one that I have. The take on him is, well, there's some good stuff in the early 90s, but by 94, he's he's pretty much out of it. I disagree with that. I think he's good through the end of 98. But there was this match that was Nishimura versus Fujinami from 2006, and that was heralded as the last great Fujinami match. It happens in Muga, which was uh, Grapple Fuck before Grapple Fuck was a thing, and it's this two out of three falls match. I was so excited to run across it. I thought, oh my god, Fujinami might be my number one after this if he's having a great match in 2006. Everyone loves this match. They put it over huge. Oh my god, that match sucks. It's two old dudes <laughs> rolling around on the mat for 25 minutes. I like. I want to like that match so much because it would do so much for my Fujinabi case that he is one of the five best wrestlers ever, which I do think he is. But oh, no, no I'm not using the Muga defense in that argument. <laughs> I, the first time I came across this, I'm a Nishimura, and this will show like when I really entered Japanese wrestling. He was in a Takara World Tag League, a World Tag Grand Prix. Jesus, I'm looking at that now. Yes, he was. He wrestled. It was uh, Nishimura in uh, Katsushi Takamura against Team Dragondor of Milano Collection AT and Skyda. I will be b- firing up my IWTV subscription and watching that match very soon. It, it, it's an interesting match. I'll leave it to that much. Uh, so that was one of your contributions. My contribution very quickly, when I, like as soon as we decided we were going to do this, they, they posted something that I know I, I saw at the time, but I completely lost all memory of it to the Dragon Gate Network. We'll have links to all these shows since it's either going to be on the Dragon Gate Network or, this, uh, or, or the UWL thing that Case has up on his YouTube. This was a special... This wasn't even like a director's cut where they had like director's cut. This was the first ever empty arena match in Dragon Gate history from September 20th, 2008 from Kyoto KBS Hall. Don Fuji versus Yamato. And boy, was that something. (laughs) I love that they uploaded this match in April of 2021 and not April of 2020 when they were running empty arena shows. That is the perfect encapsulation of what the Dragon Gate Network is is that they have this really cool archive content that they uploaded a year after it was relevant. I mean, it's also something that, like, this was just something that was happening. Like, this was, like, this huge, I mean, Don Fuji at this time was already being cycled down, and Yamato was still a solid year between before becoming Freedom Gate champion and more than that from becoming Open the Dream Gate champion. But it's just like the fact that like this is what they chose and the match they had it in the intro, which greatly amused me because case they started off with Yamato talking about this match and partway through who makes an appearance to attack him. But Don Fuji with a push up bar was trying to attack uh, a Yamato in 2021 for just no other reason than that's what he does. No, it was a hilarious introduction that I that I wasn't really expecting. And then we had a match from 2008 that. I was I was very entertained by this, perhaps not for the right reasons, but I, I did enjoy what was presented to me. Yeah, so this was an empty arena match, and the best way to describe it is uh, this was a match that apparently went on for half an hour. We got about a good solid nine minutes of it, maybe, and boy, it just was uh, Don Fuji in his element, and then breaks down and goes wild, and they clearly did this right before KBS All Show because there were fans outside and they decided to brawl outside. Yeah, I love that aspect of the match that I, I feel like maybe Gabe did this on Ring of Honor once. I know, so Gabe's final Ring of Honor show, and I don't remember who the wrestlers were, but he he booked a post-show brawl 
where it was after the show. So people started calling the cops, not knowing what was going on. And that was the final thing that Gabe did in Ring of Honor. But I feel like he also did one of these before the show, too, maybe at some point. But yeah, no, they, they brawl, you know, they start in the ring, they go backstage and then to the fans waiting to get in, which I thought was very funny. And then the match progresses to this like beyond parody point where, again, it is an empty arena match. There is no one here. And Yamada, who was in Real Hazard, the heel unit at the time, all of a sudden it gets a bunch of assistance from his buddies. There's a Real Hazard run-in that leads to Masaki Mochizuki, who was wearing white pants and no shirt, making the save. And then both the heels and the baby faces do the lariat trade in the corner in an empty arena match, which I thought was the funniest thing ever. It is, I don't know if it's a lack of self-awareness or an incredible amount of self-awareness. It popped me no matter what, though. I mean, hey, I was laughing this entire time because this match starts, Don Fuji comes out to the ring and they announce it. And then they call out for Yamato to come out. And Yam- Yamato does not come out. And then he later, like, sheepishly comes out of the entranceway and then leaves. And it just infuriates Don Fuji to, like, a level I've never seen Don Fuji that mad about someone disrespecting the empty arena match by just not wanting to fight. It just cracked me up. Yeah, no, the whole thing is... It's not a great match. I mean, I think the first the first empty arena Dragon Gate show that they ran last year, which is for free on YouTube with English commentary from March twenty second. The main of the uh, main event of that show was uh, Dragon Daya KZ and Yosuke Santa Maria versus Shimizu Ata and Kaito Ishida. Legitimately great match in my opinion. Like they have what I think is the best empty arena match I've seen, with the exception of maybe. Maybe one of the matches from New Japan Cup, but I I thought those were I hated the atmosphere of those shows. Whereas you know the first Dragon Gate Empty Arena show from March twenty second of last year that'll go down as a super fun show. We all had a, a really good time watching that, and then they came back in April and we were like, oh no, this is so depressing. This is like a bummer that this is real and that this is what it's going to be like going forward. It wasn't a great match like the uh, the six man that I just talked about, but very fun and worth your while on the Dragon Gate Network. Yeah, yeah. And if they're going to pull out weird stuff like this, I'm glad they do stuff where they have, like, Don Fuji randomly start fighting Yamato, you know, just because, you know, Don Fuji does not forget a grudge, and I appreciate that. And, like, the rich canon of Don Fuji, it's a good time. It's, like, it's like 12 minutes to watch, and it you, you get, like, a little interview, and they do the they show the video package leading up to it where, like, the most powder I've ever seen in a powder attack. Just insane. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good match that, again... I, I, I'm going to give Dragon Gate the benefit of the doubt and say an incredible amount of self-awareness to overbook an empty arena match. It was just, it was a really good time. It was a great time. And our last thing that we both watched and something that, that I, I at least want to keep on doing, because I know they're going to put up another edition of this. We have a new edition of Dragon Gate Future that went up on the network. It is from the February 26th show at Kobe Tokyo Arena. And it's interesting, uh, just off the bat for people who aren't used to or haven't seen this, and this is like the first episode, this is their new rookie project that used to be Dragon Gate Next, where basically the rookies go out there and have a shoot match for five minutes. And it always starts with groundwork, and then they work their way back up, and then it ends with strikes, and you know, it's something where like they basically shoot on each other for five minutes. And they've been doing, this is the second edition of it, they've had four rookies a part of it, they wear virtually identical gear one one set of gear is green one set of gear is black it's kind of hard to keep up with it and figure out who is who unless you like search and you discover like oh that that's riki ishi going against his brother ishin ishi but case what were your thoughts about this dragon gate future show that we had up on the network there's only two matches it's 13 minutes in total and this was from the kobe venue that they ran in the end of February, that wasn't Sambo Hall. What was the name of that venue? Tokawa Arena. Yeah, so we get a, we get them in a different environment here. I don't have the names written down in front of me, and it's uh, Drangate presents them without names. Basically, it's a real pain to figure out who these guys are. The first match, and again, they're five minute exhibitions. It takes ten minutes to watch both these deals, and and it's fun, you know, heated affairs. I thought the first match was a lot of fun, a lot of heat. I really like the chop battles. I like their grappling. Are those the two brothers that were going at it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It it was Riki Ishii Ihashi. Riki Ishashi. 
and the green and Ishin Ihashi in the black. So it was the Ish- it was the Ihashi brothers facing off. I like those two. When we talked about the the first future show, those were the guys that jumped off the page for me. Their father, former professional wrestler, so it makes sense. These are second generation talents. I like the way they emote. I like the way they hit. I like the way they grapple. Second match, I'm not gonna say it didn't do a ton for me because there wasn't a ton there to break down. But the latter of the uh, I, the least of the entertaining affairs. Yeah, so the first match, Ariki Ihashi versus Ishin Ihashi. The second match, Takumi uh, Hayakawa, who wears green, versus Takuma Fujiwara in black. I, it, it's too early to forecast any of them, but case in the first match, it was Ishin Ihashi in black, and he was the one that kind of came away from this, going like, all right, he's the one with the buzz head. He's a little bit more physically developed, but he was something that was very convincing, and the uh, grappling on the mat and he kind of dominated the first few minutes until his brother Riki basically had a full half crab had a full deep crab on right as the bell let off so these two brothers like they really kind of put together a a fun five minute match uh uh, Hayakawa and Fujiwara that was fine uh Hayakawa has a nice chop like he was blistering up uh, Fujiwara pretty strongly but it's just something that like this is them getting used to the ring and just like just it's kind of like the interesting thing is like they basically wrestle folk style for like the first two minutes of these matches like you're not seeing a lot of Lucha Libre whatsoever or anything close to Lucha Rest and I find that kind of fascinating. They're really fun matches. It's the perfect wrestling to watch on your lunch break. If you just need something for 10 or 15 minutes to just put your eyeballs on, watch the Dragon Gate Future stuff because it is, it's very entertaining just for what it is. It's something entirely different from what we've ever seen in Dragon Gate. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm trying to see if I can get up on the network and see when the next batch is. It seems like they only tape these in Kobe yeah. because... Because I know that they have another edition that's coming up later this month. I wish they would just make this website slightly easier to use. This is great audio. I apologize. But- I'm trying to find the first Dragon Gate Futures file today. I was going to do some compare and contrasting. Finding the first Dragon Gate Future event, impossible on the network. I had to go back to Twitter to find the link there. I, I could not tell you with a gun to my head how to find the first Dragon Gate Futures event specifically through the Dragon Gate Network. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of the things with how it's laid out. Sometimes you just need the direct link, and I'll provide the direct link in the show notes. The third Dragon Gate Future show, so this is the one from March on the 19th, will be released on 420. Huh, Hell yeah. That's funny. Hell yeah. But uh, it's just kind of like a cool thing to touch on. I'll be interested to see as we move along, are they going to keep doing the five-minute draws? Those are usually the mainstay of next shows. Or are we going to maybe see like a tag match between them? Are we going to start opening it up a little bit? Are they going to just keep them doing this before they they pull them back and then see where they are before they debut? Yeah, they're a lot of fun, really easy watches. I would highly recommend them because, you know, this is the future. And we'll, we'll see. We now have, what I love about this is we now have footage of these four guys from their first exhibition onwards. So if they become future Open the Dreamgate champion, we will literally have their entire careers on tape. And that's so wild to think about, you know, I mean, because like we don't have or it's kind of difficult to like find like Masaki Mochizuki's first match just because of pro wrestling war and the story he tells about times that uh, Koji Katao would make him show up to wrestling shows and be like, oh, yeah, you're fighting tonight. And he didn't know about it. So it's nice having this for these because, I mean, it's the same thing with Binke. We have Binke's first match they put up on the network as well. Yeah, for years I was holding on to this file of one of Ben K's first matches. It was the earliest footage that we had of him that I just, I happened to find a link to a thing that just happened to have this match. And then Dragon Gate Network said, actually, we're going to put his very first match up there, which is tremendous. I mean, I am still holding out for either handhelds or pro shot footage that has been sitting away in a bunker somewhere of Toriumon Mexico footage. There's a little bit on the Dragon Gate Network. If you've been following along with the Vamos Amigos Toriumon episodes, Every once in a while at the start of those broadcasts, they would show some Torimon Mexico footage. To me, that is the holy grail of being able to watch, you know, Milano, or Shima, or Yoshino from the very start of their career. That's what I would like to see. There's not a ton of that footage out there, though, but we do get from the literal ground floor these guys uh, working exhibition matches, so we'll see where they go. 
Yeah, we'll see where they'll go, and we'll keep tabs on it. Maybe the next time that we do a buffet, we'll dip back in the future to see if there's any more progress. But yeah, it's 10 minutes. It's worth it's 13 minutes for the complete file, and they end the file with them cutting promos. So really, it's like 10 minutes. But in case, is there anything else you want to hit on before we before we leave the buffet for this week? Some late-breaking news, Mike Spears. I've got one more note for you. Don't get excited. It is not the Cork and Hall card, uh, but, it, uh. but it is a show announcement with a man that we care very much about. On April 18th in Mexico, hashtag Jimmy Watch, Jimmy is wrestling Puma King on a on a Riot Lucha Libre show. I'm sorry, a Lucha meme show, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I'm now looking at this poster here. That incredibly ru- rules. The caption is, Tola Chingo is cool, and that rocks. And, yeah, like, it's nice to see that this will happen. This will be up on IWTV at some point. Yeah, that is tremendous. There is a Virus versus Latigo match on that show. People will be wildly overrating that. I can see the tweets now. <laughs> but Jimmy versus Puma King, Ryan Satin's favorite wrestler, Puma King, that is going to be a ton of fun. It's good to see Jimmy back. It's good to see Jimmy healthy. He's been crushing it in Mexico. And maybe maybe after that show, we'll have some time. We'll do a hashtag Jimmy Watch episode because he has some footage up on IWTV of the work that he's been doing since he returned to Mexico at the start of the year. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking at this poster here, and we're absolutely going to be doing that, like, no doubt about it. I, I like how, and this is something that with Lucha posters they do, and it's so great. So that is Tola Chingo is, Tola Chingo is cool. Virus versus Latico, hashtag pure wrestling. And then the foundation for Daniel Garcia versus Aramis, which I don't know. I, I, I know that Daniel Garcia has done stuff there. Oh, no, this is the promotion that did bring in Gresham. Okay. All right, and then the main event is Ricky Marvin versus Viano Three Junior. So I mean, th- there's a lot there on this show that even for me, who you know, I'm not as deep into lucha as others, that I find very interesting. Well, and even that that opening match, I know who Astro Lux is, I know who Voltrex is, and I know who the Luchador Mike is. So that's going to be a very fun match. I did not, I did not realize there was a Volano Three Junior. That is new. maybe I sound like an idiot, but that is new information to me. Yeah, Volano 3 Jr., if I'm right, he, yeah, Volano 3 Jr. works in AAA. He is. <laughs> Makes sense why I've never seen is, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was uh, their, uh, mixed ta- their mixed tag team champion of Lady Maravilla, but he left right before uh, COVID hit. <laughs> but he was, he was really solid there. Like, he was, he was really good in AAA. Yeah, and his brother is El Hio del uh, Volano 3, who's in CMLL. So it was very confusing where you had Hiho and CMLL and you had Junior in AAA. With that, Mike, I think, I, I think it is time to return our plates, to get the check, and to cash out on the Dragon System Buffet. Well, I'm going to make sure to hit the frozen yogurt machine on the way out. <laughs> they, it, it, it's always my trick whenever I go to buffets. If, if they have like a frozen yogurt machine, I, I get a cone to go. You know, I mean, why not? Let me, let me tell a quick, quick buffet anecdote. From the age... Of about four years old on, uh, my dad and I discovered a restaurant, a buffet, Super China Buffet in Noblesville, Indiana. It was next to a Christian bookstore where we used to get my mom's birthday and Christmas gifts for years. Uh, There also used to be a video store there that turned into a a carpeting store. But there was a Super China Buffet there that from age four, and I, I mean some of my earliest memories as a child are in this buffet through I went there two summers ago so i was i was 19 or 20 mike it was the exact same restaurant every oh, single naturally. i mean the same options presented the same way with a coke machine that at that point was two or three generations behind on their on their imaging like it was an old mellow yellow logo i think they had gone through three or four logo changes since then the exact same restaurant i was driving by it uh around Christmas time this past year, new owners, new everything. It's still a Chinese buffet, but it's different. And it broke my heart. Because again, my some of my earliest child memories in this buffet, and it is finally no more. I mean, I just looked up mine growing up, and sadly, it has a Yelp page, so it did last for a while. It did last until Yelp, but it is closed now. God... The older you get, you you start losing parts of your childhood, and I've lost the uh, Chinese buffet that was in Fort Worth, Texas, that no longer is closed. 
is it now a Thai place? It might now be a Thai place. <laughs> There's, I, this this episode has I have not thought about a buffet since COVID started. I I really want to go to a buffet right now. So give me that second vaccine. Mike and I are going to be in Vegas for a few weeks after that, just running that buffet circuit and gambling on uh, middle of the season MLB games. <laughs> I mean, there's few things I like. I like more than going to the Golden Nugget downtown Las Vegas, where it, it reeks of smoke. It does. It looks like an old casino because it's an old casino. But where they have the cheapest craps in town, and it's just a, it, it, it's what you got to do. I mean, I will lick the floor of the, uh, of the pit at the Golden Nugget after I get the vaccine. Maybe, probably not. I don't know. Next time I'll be in Vegas. I, I, I don't want to lie on air. And on that note, <laughs> yeah, on that note, that's going to do it for this week. Be sure to check out Case's column about the 2006 Dragon Gate Six Man match. It is an incredible piece of writing. It's something that is. I, I'm glad, if anything, that it got people thinking about that match because that is, I think, the cultural touchstone for that era of independent wrestling. And and, and as you see now, it's completely like it's is relevant 15 years later as it is today. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That already feels like it was so long ago, but that that came out last week over at VoicesOfWrestling.com. We're doing a bunch of great WrestleMania weekend rewinds. And I'm particularly happy with that piece, and I and I got a lot of great feedback on it. So thank you to everybody who has read it. And if you have not checked it out, again, voiceofwrestling.com under the WrestleMania Weekend section, it is the Blood Generation versus Do Fixer retrospective piece. I think it is the most, the the single most influential wrestling match of the modern era. Yeah, and it's on YouTube. So if you have not watched this match, maybe you need to go visit the buffet and check out this match as well. <laughs> but. But that's going to do it. You can follow the podcast at Open Voice Gate. You can follow myself at Fujiheya with two eyes like Don Fuji. You can follow Case, uh, underscore in your case. But that's going to do it for this week on Open the Voice Gate. Next week, we'll have we'll have that Corkin card that we've been anticipating because that Corkin's on Friday. We'll be talking about that and a whole lot more on Open the Voice Gate. So for Case, I'm Mike. Thanks for listening to Open the Voice Gate. Take care. <laughs>